I believe anyone that's achieved things as a parent, as a professional, as an athlete, as a business person, if they've achieved big, they're normally the kid that cried when they lost or struggled with it because they cared. I think indifference is a pandemic. It doesn't matter, chill, indifference is a problem. And I think when you tell a kid everybody wins, you're teaching indifference, it's not real life. And so my relationship with losing as a child was foundational. Attention is the number one asset. Welcome to Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios. Today, we speak with a man who isn't living rent-free in all of our heads. He's the damn landlord. (laughs) This serial entrepreneur's immigrant story is like a movie. From slanging ice at the family liquor store to owning and rebranding it, Wine Library, the multi-million dollar enterprise and beginnings of his media empire. Gary Vaynerchuk, AKA Gary V, a single nickname synonymous with success, is new media, where he holds court serving game, all aces. Amidst your whirlwind of wind and digital domination, what does good trouble mean to you? (laughs) First of all, thank you, my man. Good stuff. Um, Good trouble. It's kind of how I see the world. You know, obviously being a fan of you and really associating with your energy, I think good trouble is important. I think it's how we advance the world. I think good trouble means to me finding new ways to accept people under new norms. Um, And most of all, in the arena I play in, entrepreneurship, there's no way to succeed without causing it. You know, if you're not causing good trouble, it means you're an employee. Well, I guess like in my kind of, what I do, tennis world, you kind of get taught to be, you know, follow the rules, very different to your world, so I guess. Well, not really, this is why I fuck with you so much. What you do on the court is what I did on the stage. Mm. In 2009, when I started public speaking, all the biggest speaking bureaus in the world reach out to me and said, if you start wearing a suit instead of being so casual, and if you stop cursing, you will become one of the biggest speakers in the world. And it was really interesting. I was 34, I understood what was going on in my life. I saw the opportunity. And, and again, going back to the title, Good Trouble, you know, One may see me in 2009 cursing and wearing casual in business environments on stage as trouble, but but I saw it as good trouble. And what I mean by that was I'm incapable of being anybody but myself. Mm. It wasn't a very complicated conversation. I'm a businessman. These are multiple individuals telling me that I will be able to do more business Mm -hmm. if I compromise on these two things. What's crazy is 99% of things for me are easy to compromise on. I don't have conviction about them. I don't care about them. Uh, Many things. But if I care, I don't know how not to. Mm. And I I cared to feel comfortable. And there was no way for me to spit it unless I was comfortable. Do you feel like, you know, when you go up on stage and you're wearing what you want to wear, you're going about things the way you want to go about them. Like, do you feel like you you got punished for that in any way? Because like sure. in Wimbledon, I'm sure. like red hat in sure. white tradition sure. and paying fines here. Paying well, this money. is what's great about entrepreneurship. You get punished because there's systems in charge and you pay a fine and things happen. I get punished with the opportunities I didn't get. Do I believe that there was tons of people that are like, this guy's awesome and put my video up and the boss looked at it and said, we're not hiring in that dude. Mm. I was getting punished without seeing it. The cool thing though is Usually, when something comes along, it seems like an enigma, but sometimes it's the preview. When Alan Iverson came up, Mm. people thought it might be the enigma, but he was the preview. Every NBA player was gonna look like him 15 years later. When I came up and started doing what I was doing, I seemed like the enigma. Today, most people that give keynote speeches are pretty casual. I mean, today, when people wear a business suit to a business meeting, they usually make a joke about it because now that seems out of range. So, you know, for me, of course I was being punished. I was missing out on tons of opportunities that the 2009 business world made decisions on, but I couldn't see it the way you can see it because I wasn't in an organization, a company, a part of a tour. Well, I still don't say it that way. I still do whatever anyway. Well, well, that goes back to just being happy. Yep. Like, I, I don't understand why anyone deem success anything other than finding as much happiness as often as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, and that comes in many forms. Unfortunately, I think modern society looks at success through a lens of finances. It's much more than that. It's, It's much more than that. And that's how I view that. 
it, you know, for many people it seems silly to pay that fine. You've worked very hard for a long time to be able to afford to pay that fine to make yourself happy. Mm. So yeah, I mean, you have millions of fans. You know, well, I'm still sitting here as your fan. I watch your videos. I got friends that impersonate you, like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what would you, you know, what three words would you describe like your youth, your upbringing, like you as a person? What, what three words come to mind when you think about everything you've been through? Who you are today? The funniest thing is, I always go with what actually happened when you asked me that, and the thing that popped in my head was my mom dominated. <laughs> you know, when I think about my childhood, I'm the byproduct of tremendous parenting. Mm. You know, for the first 14 years of my life, that was my mom. My dad worked at his liquor store every hour. I barely saw him. And then from 14 to 22, I got to spend a lot of time with my dad and learn some really good, you know, old world principles that I think make me me. And so, you know, but to answer you more directly in the way I think you're asking, um, competitive. Mm. You know, it's fun to talk to a professional athlete about this. I believe we're, we've really lost our way with competition and parenting. These eighth place trophies, telling a kid that's crying when he loses, this doesn't matter, it's just a game. I think modern parenting has lost their way. If I think about my childhood, the first word that comes to mind is competition. From six to 15, I barely remember anything other than competing. Backyard football, tennis, darts, video. Every time we lost, I felt like shit the whole day. I wanted to redo it, go again. Well, I believe anyone that's achieved things as a parent, as a professional, as an athlete, as a business person, I think normally, if they've achieved big, they're normally the kid that cried when they lost or struggled with it because they cared. I think indifference is a pandemic. Mm. It doesn't matter, chill, indifference is a problem. And I think when you tell a kid everybody wins, you're teaching indifference, it's not real life. And so my relationship with losing as a child was foundational. So I think competition, then I think entrepreneurship, like it would snow in New Jersey when I was eight and every kid went out with a sled and was fired up to make a snowman and I grabbed a shovel from my garage and was ringing doorbells and was looking to shovel your driveway for three bucks. So I was very entrepreneurial, lemonade stands. It was just selling something. It was very entrepreneurial. And then just joyful. Mm. You know, I think an important thing I think a lot about is who are the people that are luckiest in their circumstance with their upbringing? And I've come to a place at 48 now where I think a child who grows up in a family that is happy and doesn't have a lot, she or he is set up for massive success because from the get, they're taught that there's not a correlation between money and happiness. And so I grew up that way with very humble beginnings, but my mom was sunshine, everything was good, always. Even when it was a struggle, I never, like it was just all happy, love, unconditional love, and that set me up. Well, I have a direct quote from you. I was a kid, I had the best mom of all time, and everything was rainbows, but we were poor as fuck. <laughs> yes. So like, I was reading through all your quotes, and I was like, went, me, me too, like I didn't have you know, a lot, but I just had the best childhood. Like, I only knew that my parents made me so happy, and I was playing tennis, and they gave me all these opportunities, but then I realized, looking back, I'm like, we really didn't have that much. They just made same, it every same. It t- I was only in my 30s where I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. Like, you know, like, they stopped buying me shit at like 11. Like, like it was just, it was my norm. And that makes sense to me. It also, when I, when I, when I found out about you, it, that's what allows people like you and I and the many that are watching that are doing it in their fields, professions, lives, the courage to do shit. Yep. When I see what you do, I don't look at it as like ridiculous or flashy or this. Look, do I think that you are naturally just an entertaining human being? Yes, I do. But no, I see it as courage. Yeah. I, you know, and I think it's fun to ask why. Yeah, I mean, my entire childhood and playing tennis, I was always asking coaches, why am I doing this? And I'm playing these shots under pressure where everyone's like, why is he doing that? He's got no discipline. He's, you know, he's not... He's not like thinking straight out there and I'm only playing this because in the moment it feels right to me and then I look at all these kids that are trying to play this way and it's inspiring for me. Like it's like a lot of kids are watching me play and they're enjoying it and they're happy and then. And they make their version of it. Yeah. You know, you were affected by the people that you saw on the come up. Yeah. Both pro, like we're affected by what we see. Mm. And so like everybody that you watched in whatever capacity you watched, that's affecting you and you are now affecting them and I view it because I see the world I think more similar to you I see it as courageous and curious. 
when you're doing what you're doing. But I also think it's encouraging. I mean, especially your Wimbledon run, it was fun for me because I've been watching for a long time and obviously you hit more of the public consciousness with that and of course that means everyone's gonna do what they do with me and others, hot take. People immediately loved you, immediately disliked you. But, but it allowed me at a lot of drinks and dinner tables and around friends and acquaintances to talk about the power of curiosity. The, the power of why, the courage of not being scared to break out, especially when it's silly ass shit. In a world where there's real shit going on, yeah, is a red fucking hat that serious? And I think these things matter and these conversations matter. And I don't think that they're as, I think most people underestimate, and I'll use tennis terms, the Agassi of it all, the McEnroe of it all, the Connors of it all. I think they underestimate the importance of those people and what they do to create new conversations and I think that's powerful. So when you entered the world of social media, what have been a yes. big change for you? Yes. And, you know, you digital personalities, all this type of stuff. Do you have someone that you like modeled or did you ever look up to someone or did you just do it on your own? No, I mean, look, I just said we were affected by somebody. I, I wasn't, no, I, I, even to this day, I don't really consume a lot. I consume the world. When I look at the way I communicate on stage, I can see the Chris Rock and Randy the Macho Man Savage of it all in the way that I talk. Yeah. The wrestler I loved, the comedian that I loved. So I think I have a cadence of communication style that was affected by others. But no, I think people learn different ways. So I think it's cool when people watch others mm -hmm. and take certain things and do their thing. Or even, you know, we see people come along that look very similar to the person that's got it right now with a little tweak. Mm -hmm. and I think that's great, that works for them. For me, I, as a person, I, I also had the luxury of not thinking that I was a personality or a personal brand. When I started making content, the concept of people being famous from the internet was foreign. So I was just talking about my truth. I, I wasn't thinking in the forms of the way every kid now thinks at 15, like I could be famous because of this. For me it was, I just wanna say certain things first about wine, then about business, then about life. And so it, there was nothing really to look towards when I was doing it. When I was make, you know, I started YouTube videos eight weeks after YouTube was launched. The fr I mean, eight weeks. There was nothing to look at. There was no Mr. Beast or Logan Paul or me or you. There was just nothing to look at. There was mainstream celebrity, but that wasn't what you saw on the internet. That was all polished and fake-ish. Yep. This started the era of potentially more real, though I've learned humans are humans. Most of what's on social is not real either now because people know people are watching, but that 2006 to 2010 era was amazing mm. because people weren't thinking about people watching them yeah. that way. They were just doing it. Yep. And then so I got very fortunate that I got the purest form of who I was because I wasn't even subconsciously let alone consciously thinking about it, I was just like, I need to spit facts, whether I'm tasting a wine yeah. from Barossa and <laughs> in, in, in Shiraz, or if I was talking about how to win on Facebook and Twitter in mm -hmm. 2008, then later it's like, oh, wait a minute, this is the thing. So I've seen multiple clips of you saying that no one works harder than you, and I've seen that, that clip, the guy was like, how do you know that? Was, you're just like, I know it's not possible, and I believe that. I'm not gonna sit here and say I work as hard as you. I probably don't. Um, but when did you realize that you had something that most, most people don't, like the, the work ethic or yeah, like the drive? Yeah, and I think in those videos, just this is what's fun about long form podcasts, I don't view it as like I work 19 hours and you work 15. Yep. I think of it as like just the pure intent and the effort in every moment. Mm -hmm. And so people can't work harder than me because they can only be tied with me. Right, right before we went on, we were giving Joker some love, right? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, there's many different people, there's plenty of people on earth that work more hours than me. There's plenty of people that work the way I work. I'm looking at some of them right now behind the cameras that are 100 when they work. Yep. As somebody who was in school and gave 2% effort and everything was everything but what was going on, mm. in work, it's 100. Yep. I'm like unreachable for 10 hours a day. Every minute is booked. But it's not even about being booked. It's, it's like when you lock in in a big match. Yep. You can't even hear it. Yeah, you can't. You can't, and that's how I am every moment that I work, because I love it. Mm. 
And because I was trained to do it. Look, I'm from immigrant parents who worked every minute. My mom raised three kids. I never saw someone helping ever. I didn't know what a, a house cleaner was. I didn't know what a babysitter was. I didn't know what a cook was, a driver. I never even heard of that shit. Yeah. That was on some Robin Leach lifestyles of the rich and famous. Yeah, like I didn't, know, and we also grew up in a neighborhood where like, I don't mean, I mean like nobody had it. Yeah. There was no such thing. I don't even know what we're talking about. So I watched two people in front of me work every minute to build a family, to build a life. And so, and then I was 14 and I'm working in my dad's store. I was working 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours. So I'm just built. It's like training. Is there one, like, one or two particular moments that stick with you that like told you or motivated you to want to get out of those positions particularly? Out of those? Yeah, like, you know, to become who you are today, like to be, you know, maybe have the opportunity to have a driver. Maybe, did you ever think like, no, I, I still to this day would argue that I try too hard to stay in the dirt. Like I don't put driver or private or, or stuff mm. on a pedestal. I put the process on a pedestal. I put kindness and civility to other human beings on a pedestal. Like I, I don't mind, I mean I don't judge or I'm not confused why people want things. Mm. I just don't think my life is better with it, I think my time is more efficient. Yep. I understand why it's good to have some things for time, which I value, so I understand it. But I don't need anything, Nick. Like, I, you know, I think that's the thing that I'm spending time thinking about now, is I don't need anything. I resonate with that, like I've got, I look back from where I started and now, I've got everything I need, and I just, I feel, I feel the same way, I don't need anything. Like sitting here interviewing you and talking with you is, never thought that would be happening. And, it's just, yeah, I resonate with it a lot and it kind of gets my next... My let's let's stay on that. Let me ask you a question just yeah. as we chop it up because since I do a podcast, I know how to do it too. Like, on that note, I believe that most people need stuff for other people, yep. not themselves. Yep. I actually think deep down, none of us need anything else. Mm -hmm. Like, you need a little bit of love in your life. Obviously, you need a roof over your head and some yeah. food. <laughs> but like, but I, basics. Like, do you think that shifted for you once you got something or was that always the consistent jam as well? Well, the thing is when I was young, I, I had everything I needed. Like my parents always made sure I was, you know, fed. I had a roof in my head. I was- A Wu-Tang shirt? Yeah, yeah, a big <laughs> Wu-Tang shirt. We'll get a picture of that. Um, but yeah, and then not until I got to this lifestyle where I, I never thought I'd be traveling around the world. You know, I, at 13, 14, I was traveling to Philippines, some of these, you know, third world countries and I was seeing, you know, people come up to me and beg and at a, as a young kid for me, that was really eye-opening, and that's what you know. Kobe said this is what he loves about tennis: is you grow, you have to grow up really quickly and independently. Yes. So I saw that, and I knew that I had a lot straight off the back. Every time I flew back to Australia, I was like, "Wow, Australia is a be beautiful yeah. place." And I feel like most people don't know that. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I've traveled the world. I've met so many different people, so many different cultures, and now I, you know, I sit here with you know Jordans on and I, I'm dressing fresh, and I don't need anything <laughs> else. You know what I mean? So, the dressing fresh you need. And, and I, from, yeah, I feel of it. Of course. But that leads to my next question. <laughs> Go ahead. You've got so much going on. Yes. And like, how do you balance that with like your normal life? So kids. Yeah, of like, course. You know, like how do, how do you do that? Um, by not overjudging myself. There is no balance. True. Who gets to decide? You? There's no work. You, me? Yeah. There's, no there's, you know, there's only, ba there is work-life balance, but it's individual. Yeah. For every one of the people that are watching and listening, them. Them and their family today. And then in a year, it changes again. Mm. And then six months, it changes again. Life moves. What looks like work-life balance. So I'm not trying to achieve work-life balance based on the world's current definition of it. Because 30 years ago, the definition of it was very different than it's gonna be in 30 years. So how do I do it? Intent. I just want to make the people I love as happy as possible to the best of my ability. But I also know that if I don't make myself happy, it's game over. Well, uh, interesting you said this because I did, um, you know, I spoke with Jay Shetty and he said that if you don't have time to recharge yourself, you can't make the other people around you, you know, happy at all. The number one observation I know, and I have a family that's pretty unique. I have plenty of family members that are super, super optimistic and happy and plenty of close family members who are incredibly cynical and, and not as happy. And there is just one through line on it all. Whoever likes themselves most is given sunshine and whoever doesn't like themselves most is given darkness. And so a lot of times people try to do nice by others and don't realize that they're building resentment toward those people, 
which then flips and then they start going dark. You have to be in a place where you're looking at yourself. The other thing is most people listening and watching are not gracious enough to themselves. This concept of beating yourself up for what you're not just kills me. Yeah. Like every one of us in this room and everyone listening is good at stuff and not good at stuff. Yep. And why we choose what we put on a pedestal and not when, when people are like, you're the great, I'm like, I'm a good businessman, I'm happy. I get it, I'm a good businessman. You just have a bit more credit. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I think I have an old soul and I have some wisdom, I get it. But still, and, yep. like let's play it out. You, you and I live a unique life where we are, going, we are publicly known. Yep. And one day, unfortunately, it's gonna be a wrap. Yes. And what's gonna happen? We're gonna get 24 hours, if we're lucky, on some love, on whatever social media is on that. Our, our family will care more for a little bit, mm-hmm. but then all of them, family included, are gonna have to wake up in a year, of fans in 24 hours, <laughs> family in three to six months, and everyone's moving. And so, you know, what, why I say that is, Like if you're gonna be dead forever and you weren't born for a long time. And so in this little window that all of us have, why not try to fight for enjoyment? And I'm I'm very passionate about that. Did you ever think you would have reached a point of this, like knowing all this at any point of your life when you were younger? Like to reach where you are now? Because I I think like for me, I'm just like, I never thought I'd reach this level of happiness through what I went through. And especially the last couple of years, like, obviously that dark period, but now I never thought it was possible. Did you ever think you were gonna be sitting here feeling this way? Yes, the reverse of you. Hmm. There was never a time I didn't feel that I would be feeling like this. But I think that has to do with this weird obsession of simplicity that I had at a very young age. My mom lost her mom at five. My dad lost his dad at 15. I would argue that the majority of my childhood, I was scared my parents were gonna die. Yeah, and so every day I was just like grateful that nothing bad happened. It's all a bonus. Yeah, and so I think that I was just focused on really heavy shit as a young child. And, and so, yeah, like I never, ever, ever, this is actually, I don't think I've ever said this. I've never strived for happiness. Mm. It's just always been there. You know, yeah. I'm never, I've never thought in my life, it's just so interesting, this moment's fun for me. I've never had the perspective of like, one day I'll be happy. It's always been, I'll always be happy, no matter what happens. Because every day that I've been given that's been good, is good, like it's good, and I'm ready for adversity, and I'm ready for challenges. This is the key, we, we started with this, with sports. I lost so much so early because I played so much and competed so much and got into fights. It was the 80s. We fought in Jersey. I really think that I'm, I got fortunate and I think that that is the driver for me of why I do what I do. There's probably a good mix of guilt and gratitude that makes me want to be Gary Vee for people because I know how blessed, just like you at 13, yeah. when you were in somewhere in Asia and you went back to Australia, like, wait a minute, I'm really fortunate. Yeah. I think I've always known that my chemicals were just a little bit more right here. Yeah. I didn't have the physical shit that you had, I, and the beauty, by the I way, and some I other stuff. I would've liked no chance. But just, this, yeah. this shit, yeah, from the beginning. yeah, this shit, like, I've never been confused that I'm in the Hall of Fame on, mm. and this shit, you know, and this shit. Yeah. Those two things, I just think I'm blessed and I'm grateful and that's how I navigate my life. So on a lighter note, well, uh, I know you're into pickleball. Yes. And, uh, but that's not the question. So when, you're, when you are buying, going to buy the Jets one, yes. we know that. What's your first move to get the Lombardi trophy? This is, hey, remember, this is going to go a lot of places. Uh, listen, I'm so prepared for this question. <laughs> I've been thinking about buying New York Jets since I was probably in third or fourth grade. That was about the time I realized I was unlikely to play for them. Because up until that point, that was the dream. Um, I'm going to audit the shit of the organization. I'm going to buy the team. And then the next day I'm gonna meet every person from the person that's been there for a week that's in concessions at the stadium to the person drafting and the general manager and I'm gonna meet every single person and I'm gonna do what I've, at that point in 30 years, I'll be 78, I'll do what I've done for the last 55 years professionally which is audit the human beings that I'm around and understand are they good at the craft but more importantly, are they good in their soul? and I'm going to make decisions based on that audit and then make some changes 
inevitably build some people up that I see something in that are not in the best place and double down on the people that I think are wonderful already and build the most epic human-based capable football organization in the world and that will directly correlate in us winning a Super Bowl. What a plan. Yeah, I mean, you know, back to like the whole point of my life, honestly, I'm not even sure if I'm gonna be happy when I buy them. Chasing them is everything. Like the enjoyment I have right this second, thinking about it, trying it, the business call I had in the parking lot before I walked in that's important. Like it's all little pieces to get there. But I weirdly think when I get there, it's gonna, yeah, I'm already like worried about it. You'll never stop, your mind. No, I won't. And I'll obviously care about other things and I'll be in a different part of my life, the back, the back half of my life, but it's, it's the chase. It's always been the chase for me. The chase is like everything. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm trying to work on at 48 years old is actually enjoying the wins. Like the people around me definitely know this about me. It's like, we do this whole thing, for they're both shaking their heads heavily. We'll be on something for like two, three years. Yes. It happens. And then you just move on. And like, we're not even there for like a second. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, yo, what, can, we, can, we, can we have at least a sip of champagne? Fuck a party, just a sip. I'm like, no, put the champagne back. We gotta go do that. Like, and not because like I'm crazy or this. It's just like, I didn't do it for the trophy. Yeah. I did it to get to the trophy. And for me buying the Jets or other things I've accomplished, that's the trophy. It's really the worst part of it. It really is. Like, I love the dirt. I love the grind. Mm. I love it. Back to tennis, nothing fucks with me more as a fan, that get, meaning I get excited about, yeah. when someone wins a five set match yeah, that they were down 0-2. Yeah. When someone, like literally, yeah. it could be second round French Open and I'll, just, I'll get home from work and just see what happened yeah. and I'll see somebody won a five set match yeah. but they lost the first two yeah. sets and I'm just like, oh, she or he is fucking fired. Yeah. Cause, that's a, a Cause that's a like, mental. Yeah, it, it feels, there's no better feeling. You come off the court and you're like, fuck, I was getting smashed and I had no way out and then you find a way to like turn it around and you can feel the momentum. Like you feel like you're getting on top of someone, like you figured him out. And you figure it out by the third set and you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming and then you win it. It's the best feeling ever. It's why I think I like tennis so much, especially a five set match. It really, to me, correlates to life. Yeah. Like, because you're trying, you're trying. The other person got it. They figured it out. They watched tape. They remember from the last match. Plus on the tour, some of that shit's carrying over from other yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody you've smacked forever comes out, wins the first two sets. They saw something when you were smacking them two months ago in the third set and finished them off, but they saw something and they were able to come out the gate. And now you have to think on your feet because there's no hiding. This is why I love sports. There's no hiding. Yeah, especially in tennis, you can't sub out either. Yeah, people call out sick at work when they're fucked up. When you're down 2-0, there's no calling out sick. You can retire and people do that shit too. And I always judge that different. You know, a little fake injury instead of losing. That's a whole different game. But I, I really... I really do think there's a tremendous correlation to a five set match in life. And this is like something inspirational for everybody. They could be looking at us and thinking, I wanna be there one day, and they might be not in a great place. And for that kid and that person, that just means you're down two sets love. Good news, it's genuinely not over. Change a relationship, quit a job, break up with a boyfriend that maybe isn't bringing you that proper energy. Stop talking to your negative mom three times a day, maybe once a month. All of us can make the hard decisions to tweak our shit to win the last three sets. Yeah, what does it mean for you to be part of you know, immigrant success and for you know, people out there who have found refuge and what, what would you say to them to get stability and to put them on the right path? I would say, real talk, I think it's an advantage. You know, like, I think we lived through a long time where we were like, oh, if you're an immigrant, that's a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. I think we're in the era now where we're starting to realize it's the reverse. An immigrant mentality, including if you're not an immigrant and you just happen to be born where you're born but you got the immigrant mentality, means just a couple things. You're willing to eat shit. Mm -hmm. You're willing to be patient. You're willing to have humility. And you're willing to put in the work, right? Like, so what would I say to all of them? I would say, congrats, you're lucky. You've been put in a situation where you're gonna have to do all the things I just said. And those are pillars, Mm -hmm. foundational blocks to not only success, but true happiness, which is the ultimate success. And so, you know, I genuinely believe it's one of the fortunate ways. I believe I was lucky to be born in the Soviet Union and come to America at three and not have stuff 
because that not have stuff was foundational in what transpired. Not just having stuff, yeah. but who I am. Stuff, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So like, I, look, I think we're in the era where being an immigrant is the blessing. I really believe that. That adversity really is a gift. Well, I guess that wraps up another episode of Good Trouble. Thank you, Gary, for making time. And- I really do appreciate it. So My God, thank you so much. Thank you. Proud of you. Thank you.